chapter 2 as we continue our series in 1 John and love the way that John writes in this particular epistle and love the concepts that he brings to us. And as we come to chapter number 2, there's an amazing concept that I believe is sometimes overlooked and often um, underappreciated in our Christian walk. In 1 John chapter 2, he says, My little children, these things write unto, unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I will pause on that phrase. We may, probably will not get to that phrase tonight. But that particular phrase, I believe, is atonement for the entire world. There is a view out there of limited atonement. Is it reformed Calvinistic theology? They said that Christ only died for a select few, uh, few people. That verse says he died for the sins of the whole world. In order to interpret that differently, you have to jump through a number of various hoops, twist other scripture and this one, and I think handle the scripture very loosely. If you ask me what I really think about it, just wait till I get that and we preach about it. <laughs> and hereby we do know, verse number three, that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Remember last week, if we look, we reference verse number six of 1 John chapter one. A couple times that John says this, that if you say this and do this, you are a liar. I love John's clear confrontation and his, and his um, uh, the way he says it so you can't get confused with what he really thinks. All right, you don't wonder what John thinks if you're not living the way you say you are, you're living. If you claim to be a Christian, not living like a Christian, John would say you're nothing but a liar. And probably, if he lived in 2019, a dirty, rotten, filthy, no good liar. All right, can you hear John as he says that? He, he doesn't mince words in this. He says, if you, if, you, if you say you do this and you really do this, you're a liar. Interesting. We'll keep on going, though. And uh, verse 5, but whoso keepeth it, his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know, no, we that we are in him. In verse 6, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Lord, I thank you for these verses and for this time that we have to look at your word. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to say those things that are true and honest going to your scripture and word. Lord, may our hearts be challenged and touched and convicted by the truths here in 1 John. In Jesus' name, amen. A few years back, I was watching, for whatever reason, and I typically mute commercials, a infomercial on television. Infomercial that was selling a miracle blade knife set. How many have ever seen an infomercial on TV? Come on. And, and how many who typically maybe don't watch those things have found yourself, for whatever reason, strangely glued to what this particular person is? Anybody found, you know, you're, you're like you can't look away almost. They're talking about this amazing, this amazing knife set, this miracle blade knife set. I mean, they say things like this this knife set never needs sharpening. It was forged in the deepest parts of the earth. Forged by elves, I think. Used by world-class chefs. It can be used to cut concrete steel and kryptonite. It'll cut a penny, right? And it'll chop a penny on TV. It'll enable you to cut vegetables into small, perfectly symmetrical pieces, all while maintaining a pristine, clean outfit and a TV-esque smile while you do it. You've seen these knife commercials? They cut like this. They don't even look, and what comes out is but perfectly square tomatoes, strawberries, it does, peas. It doesn't matter what they're cutting. They're perfectly symmetrical, and they never have a drop of food on them. I don't know about you. When I'm in the kitchen, I do cook a lot. I enjoy cooking, but I make a mess all over myself. All right, a clean chef is not to be trusted in the kitchen. All for the low price of $39.99. Unbelievable, but the answers to all of life's problems in the kitchen can be solved for $39.99. And if you buy right now, we'll give you free shipping. You've heard these infomercials before. But they don't stop right there. They have this, this kind of phrase, or they act like this, but wait, there's more. You're thinking, I'm sitting there on the edge of my seat, it seems like. Like, can it possibly get any better? I can cut kryptonite. I can save Superman. I never have to sharpen this knife set, but wait, there's more. If you buy right now, we'll send you another set. 
of miracle blade knife set that never needs sharpening forged in the darkest, deepest parts of the earth by small elves uh, that will cut everything symmetrical shapes. We'll send you a second set of miracle knives absolutely free. And what do many people do? Well, they pick up the phone. How could they do anything else? I have a set of knives. They're expensive, an expensive set of knives, but I don't have a miracle blade set of knives. My knives cut vegetables, but they don't cut concrete. My knives were, were forged in a factory, not in the darkest, deepest parts of the earth by small elves. I need those knives. You find that they sell these knives. It was a short while after that. I was down at Great Lakes Crossing, and they have a store there that's called As Seen on TV. It just so happens that I went inside that store and I found this particular knife set. Miracle Blade knife set. You can look it up. Apparently, I looked it up. Target sells this, this, this thing. All right? And I, <laughs> I went to the As Seen on TV store and we often go there at Christmas time with the family. It was just a couple years back now. And I went there and I thought, I'm going to look up this knife set, which I never bought on TV, but I remember seeing the infomercial for it. And I, and I saw, and I came to the knife set, and I'm like excited, and I grabbed this knife set. It's in a, a cardboard package like this, okay? Somehow after they forged these knives, they're able to package them in, in cheap cardboard and plastic. Unbelievably so. And I, and I pick it up, and I was shocked by how light it was. I mean, it probably did not weigh, weigh as much as, as this glass of water, it seemed like. And that was 11 knives, I think 10 knives and a pair of scissors. And I thought to myself, well, it's a good thing I didn't buy this Miracle Blade knife set because I'm sure it was just a scam. We come to 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John chapter 1, John says, listen, I am a credible witness. I am an eyewitness. We have handled, seen, and touched Jesus Christ himself. So listen to me. He says, if you listen to me, you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ, fellowship with the Father and with another, like we have, John says. And if you have this relationship, 1 John, uh, he says in chapter 1, you'll have joy that is unmatched and unbounded. It'll be joy that will be full. It'll be happiness. It'll be incredible in your life. And you want to walk in the light, not the darkness. If you don't walk in light, you're either a liar, you're a deceiver, you're going to call God a liar. And you can then, if you mess up, you can restore your fellowship, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And then we come to chapter 2, and it is as if John says, but wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. He says the first phrase in 1 John chapter 2, my little children, these things write I unto you, that phrase, that ye sin not. It's like John says, listen, if you do what I say, then you can have a life that is filled without sin. You say, wait a second, Pastor Howell, are you saying it's possible to have sinless perfection? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that's what John is saying by the guidance and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You say, Pastor Howell, that's, that's kind of scary. Well, we're going to look at the Scripture. I'm going to unwrap it for you. And I think that if we look at the Scripture, I think you will agree with what the interpretation that I see that John is saying. Because he's saying, listen here, if you do these things, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. He says you don't have to live a life of sin. You don't have to live a life that displeases God. You don't have to make mistakes in your life. You can live a life that pleases God in fellowship full of joy. But wait, there's more. We'll look tonight at this passage and unwrap this passage if we can from 1 John. I want to first of all, before we get to that particular phrase, look at the first three words of chapter number 2. Where John says this, my little children. Now it's interesting because the chapter divisions w would not have been in there when John wrote this epistle. He wrote it like a letter. It was added later on in, in time, and, and it was very helpful for us because we can find these, these delineations in there, and, and they're helpful. Uh, but, but John did not put a big number two and then write. He wrote like a letter and just wrote to the next paragraph. And, and you see here where it says, my little children, if you remember, though, when he began, he kind of talked to people and never really addressed it. But he comes here about 10 verses into, the, in, in, into his letter, and he has this little fond phrase, and he says, my little children. I want to see, first of all, the fondness that we see. It's, it's my beloved, a special fondness, a, a special closeness. You see, one of the major, major emphases of John is from the fondness from a father. 
Now we see here John, the idea is John as a father, my little children. He's talking to Christians, obviously, and he's saying, listen, you're my children in the faith. You're my children in the Lord. You're, you're so, some people that I really love and really care about, and, and I'm fond of you. I really kind of like you. There's a fondness, but it goes beyond that because throughout the book of 1 John, you'll see an emphasis of John on the love of the Father, our Heavenly Father. Phrases like this, God is love, right? In chapter 3 of 1 John, you'll, you'll see that, Behold, what manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us. Talking about love. And if you reference the Gospel of John, you'll remember this familiar verse, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world. A familiar theme of John about this love. Not only from a father, but from a family. You see, there's a fondness, my little children, idea of a family found. Not just one child, my little child, my little children. Because once we're saved, we become part of the family of God. You say, well, what's the big deal about this, Pastor Howell? I'll tell you the big deal. We are bombarded with the thought process from us and from outside that no one really cares. But in our mind, it tells us, listen, I know what you're going through, but look at those other people who are sitting there by your church. They don't really know, and really, they don't even care about you. They may ask about you, and they may act like they care, and a pastor may act like he prays for and cares, but he doesn't really care, and that's a lie straight from the devil himself. Because not only does God love us, there are people around you in this great church who love you and care about you and pray for you all the time. And if you reach out, they'll pray for you more. You see, the thought that no one really cares and no one gives a rib is not from the Father, all right? It's from the deceiver. Your heavenly Father loves you so much, but your spiritual family loves you so much. You come to this church, and sometimes you come in, and, you're, and you feel kind of down in here, but there's people that love you, and they care about you, my little children. You come here, and, and it's a bad day, and we all have those bad days where things just don't seem to go right, but you can come to a, to a family where there's folks who are like you, and who like you. You find that at church, there's people who walk the same path that you walk, who have some of the same struggles that you have. Every once in a while, in fact, uh, my wife gets irritated with me, if you can believe it or not. I find it hard to believe. I never get irritated with myself, but somehow she finds a way to get irritated with me. But you find out that not every marriage in the church is perfect. Why? Because we're flesh and blood, but God loves us, and your family here at church loves you. John says, my little children, don't forget about the fondness it's around you. You say, your mind wants to tell you no one cares. Mind wants to say, listen, you're, you're in this all alone. And no one knows exactly how you feel. And, and then you're tempted to keep it all right here. And John says, no, my little children, I, wanna, I want you to know that I care about you and I have a special fondness for you. That little phrase, my little children, was used often to denote a, a special closeness, like a special little buddy. Sometimes you'll have a secret handshake with somebody and kids will have that or a secret password in a club with elementary students, a special closeness. Sometimes an uncle to a nephew will have a, a special name or a grandfather to a grandson. They'll call their grandfather a different name or a special name. That's what John is saying. My little children, a little bit of closeness here. There's the fondness here. But not only do I see the fondness, I see the freedom. This is the, but wait, there's more section. He says this, my little children, these things write I unto you. Well, the first question to ask is, what things is he writing about? What things is he referring to? Is he referring to how to make great mac and cheese, these things? Of course not. Is he writing about how to fix a car? Well, it would be helpful if John did, but of course he's not. He says these things knowing that we would understand that the things that he just said previously, the things that we now look at in chapter 1, are the things that he's talking about. What things? Talking about fellowship, talking about joy, talking about being a witness. He says these things, that support that I've asked you to follow. He says these things have I written unto you, and these four words, that ye sin not. So is it possible is it possible for a Christian to live a life now free from sin? You say, well, Pastor Howell, I know some really good Christians, and, and they still make some mistakes. Well, so do I. I didn't say if you know some Christians, you make some mistakes. I'm asking you, from what John says, is it possible for a Christian to live a life free from sin? 
It is not possible for a person, a human, because we're all born into sin, but John makes a case here. And here's what I want you to see. John makes a case in 1 John chapter number 1. He says, listen, if you're going to have fellowship with God, I want you to abide or walk with God, right? What does that look like? We talked about that. It's not a sprint, but it's like a marathon. It's a walk. I'm taking one step with God every step of every day. Now, now understand something. If I walk with God all day long, I walk with God, have fellowship with God, will I make decisions based upon what God wants? Well, yes. If I do that continually, would I make a wrong decision? Not if I'm walking with God. If God's working in me and, and, and working through me, I'm going to live and, and make the right decisions. John says, listen, if you do what I'm telling you, you're going to live a life without sin. Why? Let me explain this first of all. There's a freedom from sin. That she sin, not a freedom from sin. You see, the problem I have with, without this concept, if freedom wasn't possible, then it wouldn't be freedom. You see that, that uh, I say this phrase, once in bondage, now in freedom. Romans 6.22 says this, Paul says, But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end of everlasting life. John 8.36 says this, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So if we are saved, if we are truly saved, then we have the ability to walk in the freedom that Christ has promised. If we were to answer, no, that I can't live a sinless life, I can't follow God every day, then I'm saying I am still bound to sin. But I'm not bound to sin. Once Christ has saved me, I have the freedom, I have the ability to say no to sin every single time. Because of my ability, no, but because of Christ's freedom and his power working through me. So if Christ's power is working through me, all right, all the time, will that power ever fail? The answer is no, it can't. There's a freedom from a sin. And John is presenting, he said, listen, I've told you these things, so you walk with me, you abide with me, so you live in the freedom, not in the bondage. You were in bondage, now you're free. You were slaves, now you're free. You didn't get to choose, now you get to choose. He says, and if you choose right, then you won't choose wrong. That's what John says, right? He says those kind of phrases. If you walk in the light, then you're not going to walk in the darkness. You're a liar, you're a deceiver, God's a liar. And so once in bondage, now in freedom. And the question I would ask you is, are you free or did you go back? There's this concept in the, in the, in the judicial system called recidivism. The concept is how often will a, someone who's been convicted and been into, incarcerated will go back to, to prison. It refers to a person's relapse into criminal behavior. It's measured by criminal acts that resulted in rearrest, reconviction, or return to prison with or without a new sentence during a three year period following the prisoner's release. They find that an estimated 68% of released prisoners were rearrested within three years, 79% within six years, and 83% within nine years. Basically, what they're saying is 83% of the time that someone has gone to prison, they'll be back in prison within nine years, 83% of the time. I pose the question this way, though, to us. How many Christians who have been released from the prison of sin have gone back to it? Because if the Son has made you free, you shall be free indeed. Christ didn't fail. His power hasn't failed. He's released us from the bondage. And John says, I've written unto you these things that you remain free, that you sin not that you live over here in this newfound, undeserved, unmerited, grace-given freedom. The ability to look at life and to say, I choose to follow God. The ability to now look at sin and say, you know what, I can now say no. I was in bondage, I was in prison and in the shackles, but now, like we sang tonight, my chains are gone, I've been set free. Amen. The ability to live in freedom. And how many Christians unfortunately go back and they say, that's okay. I like being in shackles. I like having this struggle in my life. I like being angry. So shackle me up. 
because I don't want to walk in God's power. I like being a gossip, so shackle me up. I don't want to live in God's power. I like being depressed. Living life this way, so shackle me up. I don't appreciate God's power. I like living in the flesh. I like doing my own thing. I don't want to live in God's power. And John says, with a special fondness, my little children, these things have I written unto you. Why? So you, so you live over there. Once in bondage, now in freedom. But there's another hidden concept here. Once a beggar, now in affluence. We find this throughout the New Testament, that once we're saved, we have the riches of Jesus Christ. You see, not only is this place over here bondage, but you're broke. And I don't know about you, but in a purely physical sense, I don't like to be broke. Broke has different definitions for different people. Some people will feel broke with $5,000 in their bank account. Some of you would feel like you hit the lottery with $5,000. Some people will feel broke if they have under $1,000 in their pocket. Some people would feel like they're on a shopping spree if they had 1000 bucks in their pocket. But Christ has said, listen, if you come to me, once you entertain me in your life and once you believe on me, you have my riches. So not only do Christians live in bondage, but they live as a beggar, scraping the bottom, if I can, living by grace, paycheck to paycheck. I know of Christians who it seems like how they're living is just, God, I need your grace for right now, where God says, I promise to give you grace more than you could ask or think. You know, my grace that are riches beyond compare, beyond comparison, and, and, and you can have all that. Once a beggar, now you're in affluence. You're my child, and you're the child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're the child of the creator of the universe, a child of someone who has made everything out there. He is not a weak, and he is not a poor father or king. He is rich beyond comparison, and I'm his kid. And John says, my little children, I want you to have this relationship, this fellowship. You have this fellowship so that you don't sin. Because when you realize that you're free and you don't go back to bondage, and when you realize it over here, the life is a whole lot better. It's better to live in the riches of Christ than in the depths of brokenness with sin, the flesh, and the devil. See, John says you can have this freedom. They say that 70% of lottery winners end up bankrupt within five years of receiving a large financial windfall. They say that lottery winners are more likely to declare bankruptcy within three to five years than the average American. And nearly one-third of all lottery winners will eventually dec declare bankruptcy. That's what they say. I've never won the lottery, not in the physical sense. But I have driven down the highway. And I see what the Mega Million Cap is at. I'm sure many of you have seen this as well. And maybe you're like me, you begin to think what you would do if you won that, if you won that money. Of course, I'd tie 20% instantly, maybe even 25% for God, all right? Let's not, let's not be ungenerous here. Lord, if you give me that lottery, we'll give it all back to you. And I mean, I guess that'd be a hard conversation. Oh, well, deacons, I have good news and bad news. Bad news is I'm resigning as pastor of First Baptist Church, but on my way out, I'm going to give you $65 million dollars. We'd give 25% of lottery, correct? And then we'd say, well, I, I need this, and I could do this, and I buy a house for this people, and, and take care of this and that. And, and maybe if you're like me, you, you might have played with those numbers like that. As I look at Scripture, I see that when I got Christ, I won the lottery. And I never have to declare spiritual bankruptcy. I can go back to the source. I can go back to the well. I can go back to the foundry. I can go back to Fort Knox spiritually. I can get riches every single day. Yet, we have Christians living in spiritual bankruptcy. Not only are they in bondage, they are spiritually broke. Not because the offer's not there, because they're not accessing it. And John says, my little children, 
These things write I unto you that ye sin not. You see, if I can apply it this way, <laughs> if you won the lottery, I imagine you'd be pretty happy. I think you would be. Just be honest, I, I would be. Listen, it, listen, if you buy me a lottery ticket and I win, I'll, I'll thank you for it. I'll write you a nice note. <laughs> you'd be pretty happy, I would imagine. Right? Yet, John says, if you follow this, your joy, your happiness will be full. He's the one that says, this is beyond comparison. This is bigger than you can possibly imagine. You see, there's freedom from sin, but there's also this concept, not only from sin that you sin not, I believe there's a freedom for holiness. We're not just called to be anti-sin. We're called to be like Jesus Christ, to be like God. Peter says it this way, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. John says in chapter number one, don't just not walk in darkness, walk in holiness, walk in the light. We're called to be holy. If I follow what John wrote, can I be sinless? Yes, if I walk in the light, I can follow God. The words abide, I can abide with Jesus Christ. Victory is possible. Victory is possible when I walk with Jesus Christ. If you want victory in your life, if you want to be spiritually, lit, spiritually rich, then John says, then abide with Christ, have fellowship with God, and walk in the light. And if you do that, you will be free and you will be rich. Is it possible? I would argue absolutely. Absolutely from Scripture. Is it probable? No. No. That's why John says this, my little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And he says this next phrase, and if any man sin. Possible? Absolutely. From Scripture. Probable? And if any man sin. Are you going to remain in victory all the time? I wish that were the case. Is it an excuse? No. It is unexcusable, but it's realistic. It's realistic that sometime between now and the time that you go to heaven, you're going to make a mistake. It's just realistic. Sometime between now and the time that I go to heaven, I'm going to, I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to have an attitude that, that isn't right, something that doesn't please the Lord. And, and John says there's a failure, and it's realistic, realistic. It's not impossible, but it's probable. What I don't want, though I never want it to be, terminal. You see, John says, and if any man sin, he says it's realistic, but it's recoverable. This is what I love about John. He, he makes his, he says, listen, you can live a life that's free, but, but if you mess up, and really when you mess up, not if, but when you mess up, when you choose the wrong way, when you choose to walk in the flesh, when you choose to have a bad attitude, when you choose to put yourself first before God, when you choose not to pray and said to listen to this or, or do that. He says, but when you mess up, if any man sin, we have a, a friend. If you look in the scripture, I see our friend tonight. And his name is Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful for Jesus Christ. Our friend, which we'll just look at just for a second tonight, which is our advocate, he argues for you and for me. He pleads for you and for me. And he pleads before the throne of grace, and his name is Jesus Christ. And in case you missed it, who it was, he's the righteous one. He's the righteous that's the way that John writes Jesus Christ. Which one? The righteous Jesus Christ, the only Jesus Christ, the only one that can be our advocate. His name is Jesus. That's the one that advocates for you and for me. Amen. He's a high-profile friend. He's in heaven. He's a powerful friend. He's near the throne of, of God himself. <laughs> He has unlimited power, a public defender. He cannot be tricked as our advocate. No one can pull a fast one on Jesus Christ. No one can deceive him. John says, my little children, my special ones, my family, 
If you do what I say, really what God has told me to tell you, you can live in freedom. But if you mess up, when you do, don't forget that you have a friend. His name is Jesus. And we should remember that just two sentences earlier, he said, and if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, really to restore us from all unrighteousness. We can get back to that fantastically rich, fantastically free life of fellowship with him. That's the freedom that Jesus Christ brings. Lord, I thank you for your word, and I thank you